Hi, everyone. Let's start our webinar. And um, I'm very happy to present Sinead. Sinead, please, here you go. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sinead uh, on the customer success team here at Codility. Uh, we're excited to uh, dive into the topic of uh, uh, building a great uh, candidate experience today. Uh, we're going to be joined by uh, Damina McQuaid, uh, who is the lead data center recruiter at Microsoft to discuss this topic. Uh, before we dive in, I wanna set a quick, quick agenda. Um, so we'll go ahead and start off with some insights that we've seen you know, from several teams as we've transitioned to remote work over the last several months. Um, and then we'll hear from Jamina on this topic specifically. Um, and we'd like to keep this conversation interactive um, and relevant. So please feel free to introduce, introduce yourself on the chat, um, leave a question, uh, and uh, we're happy to, you know, to go ahead and get started. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and, you know, wait for the slides here. Um, so now that we've uh, set our quick agenda, we're going to just dive into a couple of uh, quick insights around the shift to remote work. So, you know, I think it's no surprise to anybody that the state of remote work is a, a lot different uh, than it used to be, um, and even really just different from a lot of the predictions we've heard over the last couple of years due to, you know, you know, global shifts in um, in how we interact and, and work online. Um, you know, it's not news that that we all have, especially in technology, shifted uh, to working from home. Um, and 88% of our organizations have made this move, right? Um, but with these global events shifting, something that's really kind of surprising is that it wasn't really the, the main instigator or main trigger for this type of change for a lot of organizations. You know, I think the, the current uh, situation with COVID-19, you know, was a trigger for a lot of teams, but the idea of flexible work and remote working policies has been a, a, a big topic for, for a long time. Um, and I think it is a, a big indicator of the change that is going to stay here, um, even you know as things return to normal slowly but surely. Um, so even with all this quick adaptation that we've seen from organizations to remote work, um, you know, still over half of, of the organizations that um, were surveyed uh, you know, on this topic you know, consider technology and infrastructure to be some of the largest barriers to continuing to improve the flexibility we have at work. Um, you know, this really shows us that that it is here to stay, that people were already making this change, but it's, you know, super important for us to continue to build um, remote first approaches and processes um, because they still will have a, a large impact in on our day-to-day -day work in the future, regardless of um, you know, the state of, let's say, uh, world health and, and of course, COVID-19. So kind of shifting from that catalyst, um, we kind of want to keep in mind, what does this mean for uh, for our employees, right? So going into the, the next slide um, on some stats around what remote work means for, for our organizations, uh, ultimately, research shows that flexible work um, has had a positive impact on workforce retention. Uh, ultimately, we've seen that the majority of the corporate workforce, um, you know, is currently more productive at higher rates than, uh, than they maybe are in corporate offices. And so we really should expect this trend to continue um, because if everyone's, you know, getting their jobs done, uh, getting them done happily, then we get to keep and, and continue to build and, and foster that, uh, that good culture within our organizations. Um, and this really might even be a, a good thing, right? Because, you know, I wasn't surprised to see that, you know, almost 40% uh, of remote workers report being more productive. Uh, I know for myself, I can now plan effective work time with no interruptions. I can close the door um, and really plug in. And this has been a game changer, you know, for me, but I think it has been the same for a lot of teams as well in terms of 
delivering effective, you know, projects and work and um, and all of that kind of stuff. So I'm sure that many other teams have seen this positive shift. And so therefore, you know, it, it comes as no, no surprise that a lot of organizations are planning to permanently shift to more flexible work. Um, and this is going to help in a lot of areas, right? Being able to have that uh, kind of more even like casual relationship between your day-to-day -day life, getting your work done and being able to do that on your own time um, is, is a really exciting permanent shift to see uh, for a lot of organizations. So uh, I guess with that, um, you going to go ahead and pass this off to, to Damina. I'm really excited to, to learn from her today. And, uh, and uh, there we go, I'll pass it off. Awesome, thank you. I'm excited to be here. One of my favorite things to do is just nerd out about you know, recruiting trends. So before we get rolling, um, let's tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a pilot turned recruiter, you know, just a slight career change. Um, and outside of work, I'm a mom to a crazy four-year-old little girl. She's like spunky, charismatic. Um, I'm married to a sales guy. He, he keeps life interesting and fun. Um, also a doggy mom. My dog is actually by my feet right now. Probably my favorite coworker uh, this week. <laughs> cool. Uh, so as far as recruiting, I have eight years of recruiting experience. Um, I've been at Microsoft almost five. Um, I've done all kinds of recruiting. Um, as of late, mostly tech recruiting, but I've done sales recruiting, non-tech roles, um, campus recruiting, uh, kind of a mixed bag. And my current role is um, I'm leading data center recruiting for, for Microsoft right now. Um, so I'm a, a people manager and then um, depending on uh, bandwidth, I sometimes handle the principal and director level roles for, for data centers. Um, Cool, we can go to the next one. So I figured I'd start out a little bit about why I work for Microsoft. Um, so the first bullet there, it may sound a little corny about it aligning with my personal values, but it's actually true. Um, you know, things that I care about are things that Microsoft cares about. You know, like diversity is kind of a hot topic right now and companies are, um, you know, really, talking about it and focusing on it, but Microsoft has been focusing on diversity for several years now. I've been at Microsoft five years and it's been one of our number one priorities the whole time I've been here. And I know it was even before I got here. Um, you know, they do a lot of like charity and giving back. I feel like they really set the bar for corporate responsibility um, when it comes to like environmental issues and, and things like that, you know, um, like you go on campus, when you could go on campus and uh, everything was compostable. Um, they, uh, you know, all other companies are going carbon neutral and Microsoft, it pushes the limits and our goal is to go carbon negative. Um, so it just really aligns with my personal values. Um, second bullet there, mentorship and growth opportunities. Um, I mean, I've probably had in five years, like 27 mentors. Granted, I probably had a little bit more rough edges than others to, to round out, but, they just really invest in their employees. Um, and uh, there's a lot of growth opportunities. It's such a large company that you can move around and have different experiences and learn and grow and try new things within the same company, which is really cool. Um, also, they just, they treat their employees great. You know, um, not only do they have great benefits, but um, you're encouraged to use them. Like I've seen companies where they have strong, you know, maternity, paternity benefits, but it's culturally not really acceptable to use that full time. At Microsoft, everyone does. And um, a lot of the leaders here, uh, at least in the recruiting org, they have kids and families. And so you never have to make the choice of like, do I want to be a, have a successful career at, or be a good mom? Like I'm able to do both here. Um, and so when you see recruiters at Microsoft that have stayed there for, you know, 10, 20 more years, um, it's for a reason. They just, they treat people well. Um, flexibility, super important. Uh, again, as a working mom, I, flexible hours and the ability to work, you know, remote even before COVID was key. Um, and, you know, it's, it's the type of culture where you don't have to feel bad about if your kid gets sick or if there's a snow day. Um, people get it, um, which leads into to team culture. Um, it, a lot of recruiting cultures are kind of like competitive and 
um, cutthroat and they're like sharking each other for, for candidates. Um, that just doesn't really happen at Microsoft. We're, um, we have metrics obviously, but um, we're also metriced on, are you helping making others better and building off of their ideas? And so it's kind of created this like collaborative, fun team. Um, you know, we're like an awkward family that uh, is like really close. Like we all kind of tease each other, but um, we're closer than coworkers. We're, we're more like friends or, or family. Um, so that's just a little bit about why I'm there. Um, so I wanted to take a look at what interviewing looked like before COVID, just to, to give you an idea of the changes that we made. Um, prior to COVID, um, it, our interview process was a three-step process. Um, you know, the recruiter would do a phone screen, talk about all the HR stuff, like, um, you know, are you eligible to work in the country? Do you need relocation? They'd met the candidates' compensation expectations, you know, get to know them, you know, what their motivations are, what type of role they're looking for, so we could align them properly. So that was done in step one in the recruiter phone screen. Um, step two, is uh, was um, either a hiring manager phone screen or an online tech assessment of some sort, similar to, to Codility. Um, and there, the manager would be testing both technical skills and um, competencies. Um, then the third one is on-site loop. So prior to COVID, we used to fly every candidate um, that wasn't local to Redmond or whichever office that they were interviewing with um, to do about four or five interviews in one day, which um, that sounds like a lot, but we used to do it for efficiency sake, you know, so candidates didn't have to take more than one day off work. And, and also just so like interview processes didn't drag out months. Um, so that's what, what interviewing used to look like. And obviously global pandemic, there's been some changes. Uh, so everything has changed basically. Um, it's pretty impressive. Microsoft's a huge company and it's, it's, I still am in awe about how quickly we're able to pivot, um, at the scale of hiring that we do, how quickly we're able to pivot to remote only. Um, so very early on, we, um, we, we shifted all onsite interviews to teams video calls. Um, and, uh, we did it pretty seamlessly. Um, it was incredible. Um, we moved orientation um, to completely remote. Um, I know a lot of our competitors um, had to um, cancel some orientation dates and kind of had a backlog of people needing to start. Um, for us, we kind of did it in stages. Um, early on, we did like an essentials only approach to orientation where people were just getting like their badge and equipment. Um, and, then, um, and then it moved fully remote very quickly after. Um, and so, uh, we, I, we do orientations every week and I don't think we even had to, to cancel any, which was great for candidate experience. Um, and again, impressive how that team did that so quickly with the, the huge volume of, of candidates that go to our, our orientations. Um, and another thing that we did is, um, very early on, um, Microsoft was keeping tabs on COVID before it even came to the US because we have offices in, um, in China. And um, so I think it was like late February, Microsoft made the shift to have everyone work from home for a month. Um, a, a lot of other um, Puget Sound companies like Seattle area companies like Amazon did the same thing, which um, was really smart because I think it stopped the spread in this area since there's such um, huge employers for us in this in this area so basically everyone moved to remote and they've extended it um, we're still all working remote um, the only exception is essential employees which um, are like data center i support uh, essential employees you know without data centers there is no cloud um, and so um, the people that have to physically work on you know in the data centers and servers and stuff um they're considered essential because they're keeping the cloud up and running for all of us to to work and and um and enjoy um and then uh i think i already mentioned this but we did move remote very quickly and at scale um some other cool things that we did we had some extra benefits um one of my favorite benefits at microsoft is our backup daycare um benefit so normally you can call them at like any hour 
of the day or night, like at midnight and tell them that your daycare or child care fell through and they'll find you either a daycare that is by your home or by the office. Um, and so they switch that benefit to being able to use it for um, somebody in your network, like a friend or family member, um, somebody, you know, you don't really want like a stranger nanny coming to your house or, you know, your kid going to a daycare that you don't know. So they switched it to where you could use someone that, that you knew and felt safe having in your home, which was nice. Um, they did a benefit where you could take leave. Um, I think it was 12 weeks. Um, uh, if, you know, you had, um, you know, kids or family issues, um, uh, so they had like a COVID leave. Um, they completely rearranged their benefit site. So they had like a, a hotline, a COVID hotline, and you could call them if you're feeling symptoms and they would like link you to the best possible like virtual doctor and, um, and place near you to get tested. Even at, on our Microsoft campus, they had um, a drive-through testing center there um, eventually too. So they added a bunch of extra benefits to help. Um, lots of extra support, tech support too, if you're having like issues, um, with VPN and things like that. So um, the extra benefits helped for sure. So one hot topic of discussion in recruiting right now is the benefits versus the challenges of remote hiring. Uh, there are a lot of benefits. Um, cost, number one. Um, there's a ton of cost. When you're flying candidates here, um, you know, there's airfare, uh, hotel, rental car, or taxi, Uber cost. Um, you know, we give people a per diem for like food and stuff. So um, it's a huge cost savings. Um, there's, it's basically no cost, uh, except for, I guess, time um, uh, with remote hiring, um, speed. Um, it's a lot faster to schedule interviews because if a candidate didn't live locally, they um, usually we had to push those interviews out farther. So um, the candidate could take time off work and like plan airfare, if they have families, plan childcare, all those logistics. Um, so we're, we're able to schedule interviews faster. Um, also, we can have interviews over multiple days. And so, um, you know, let's say like one person on the interview loop wasn't available. Normally we have to push it out to a farther date where everyone can make it or find an alternate. Um, you know, we can easily split it over multiple days. Um, environmental, uh, you probably realize I'm a little bit of a hippie, but I care a lot about the environment. Um, and uh, so, you know, Microsoft has this goal of becoming carbon negative and, you know, flying, we do so many interviews at, so, you know, we're huge scale. And so um, I think that the environmental less airfare means, you know, helps us get to that carbon negative goal my mind. Um, also scale. Um, it's really easy to scale your interviewing with virtual interviews. One limitation that we have is um, usually space, actually, um, like interview rooms. And so that limits us of how many hiring events we can do per day, because um, we only have so many interview rooms. But with virtual, that's that's not really a, a consideration. You could have multiple hiring events going at the same time even. Um, so the scale is endless. Um, so challenges, um, logistics and tech. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some hic hiccups sometimes with like latency issues with the video um, uh, or, you know, a candidate maybe not knowing how to log into Teams or, you know, having some glitches there. Um, so that, that happens sometimes uh, like time zone, you know, whereas if a candidate was here locally, there wouldn't really be any question about what time it was, but sometimes like candidates or hiring managers look at the time zone differently. Um, so a couple of hiccups there. The fix for that is for the recruiter prep call before the interview is just become crucial. Um, double checking all of those logistics, um, uh, testing the tech equipment with a candidate ahead of time, um, just making sure that there's no question that it'll work gives candidates a lot more confidence going into it. Um, candidate experience is another possible challenge. Um, you know, in early on when we were booking interviews, they were an hour each and back to back, just like a loop would have been in person. But we quickly realized that candidates, when they're on site, you know, they're walking from one interview room, one office to another, so they get a chance to like stand up and 
um, you know, maybe grab coffee or water, or use the restroom. But if they're scheduled back to back, um, then there's no real opportunity. You know, they're staring at a screen for maybe five hours. Um, and so, um, you know, shortening those to 45 minutes, they have breaks in between. Um, also, you know, with candidate experience, it's a little bit harder to get a sense of Microsoft's culture. Um, and uh, so hiring managers need to be really intentional about that. Um, what else? Um, I think there are some positives to candidate experience too. Like um, back when we did on-site interviews, um, you'd always hear about like somebody's flight getting delayed and they were up to like two o'clock in the morning and then they had a whole day of coding and designing um, when they were tired. So there are some benefits there too. Um, the third bullet there is candidate quality. Um, I put a question mark there because we really don't know if it's affected yet. Um, and it's kind of a weird time to look at the data too, because there's a lot going on in the world, right? There's a global pandemic and a recession at the same time. And so, um, you know, in some cases, can't, like unemployment's high, so the candidates that don't have a job are probably really eager to, to accept offers. Um, but then there, we're also seeing challenges of, you know, people that have job security, maybe it being a little harder to get them to move because they're anxious about what's gonna happen with the economy. Um, so um, long story short, we don't really have strong data on that yet, but nothing noticeable um, as far as quality uh, or acceptance rate. Um, another challenge is um, partners. Um, Microsoft's a huge company and a lot of other companies depend on Microsoft for, for benefits. So when you think about you know, cutting out um, candidates coming here, that has a lot of repercussions. Like, you know, that's a lot less flights for the airlines we're partnered with. Same thing with hotels and, and um, catering companies, all kinds of stuff. So, um, so lots of both benefits and challenges to, to the new climate we're in. Um, it's all about candidate experience. It's my opinion that candidate experience is even more important during this time. Like I was touching on, um, you know, there's a lot of, of candidates that are scared to move jobs right now. Um, some recruiters on my team are, um, and I don't have like strong data on this yet, but they're saying that they're getting less uh, applicants and internal transfers even at Microsoft. Um, and, you know, I think about myself and like everything going on in the world is a little overwhelming right now and taxing, especially if you have kids at home. And so um, I think that candidate experience and is going to be key to getting some candidates to, to move during this um, to your company. Um, so some things to think about is um, spending extra time prepping the candidate on logistics. I mentioned this already, but super crucial that both the schedulers, the recruiters and the hiring managers um, are showing up on time and there's no misses there. Um, Testing the tech prior to the interview. Um, again, that's gonna give the, the candidate confidence going into that first interview, because if it doesn't work, uh, I can tell you that that candidate's gonna be rattled and probably isn't gonna do their best job. Um, prepping hiring team on differences. Um, we've spent some time on my team doing this. Um, there's just differences. When, when you meet someone in person, you usually shake their hand, you have a couple minutes of small talk, and it's just like organic and natural. When you're meeting someone on a video call, sometimes it's not first instinct to think about that small that's like small talk and warming the candidate up and making them feel comfortable. Um, also, prepping the hiring teams, how crucial it is to be on time. Because um, let's say someone was late for the next round of interviews. If the candidate was sitting out in the reception area, the receptionist would notice, we would, we would know. Um, but if somebody's just sitting on a team's line, um, you know, it's it's harder to detect when somebody's late or there's there's a miss. So also, you know, recruiters make sure that you're um, staying in touch and available um, in case there's any hiccups. Um, and then the last thing there on differences is culture. When a candidate comes on site, they're going to feel your culture. They're going to see it. They're going to see how you interact with your uh, coworkers. Like if if somebody was to walk down my row um, on uh, in recruiting, they would see like. Rob making his dad jokes and then us heckling him back or Jamie being, you know, crazy and, and fun and, and outgoing or 
you know, we all are friends and close and people can feel that culture. Um, so it's a little harder to describe it, you know, um, like how do you describe that culture to, to a candidate and, and to where they'll believe you too, because when they see it, it's a little bit more credible. And again, if candidates are anxious to make moves right now, then your selling of the candidate and descri description of those things is even more important. Um, I touched on this before, but schedule breaks in between the interviews. Um, you could even do it in multiple days because um, recruiting or interviewing is exhausting. <laughs> and um, I think that the fatigue factor of staring at a screen for five hours is, um, is even more intense than being in an in-person interview. Um, I've heard of some companies sending lunch to the candidate. You know, if you're going to have someone, you know, sit with you for four or five hours, I think it's a nice touch. You know, um, a lot of companies do did that with on-site interviews. Um, but what are you doing as the special touches to, to sell someone to, to your company? Um, I guess I skipped ahead uh, talking about culture, but we already covered that. Cool. So trends. I think that this global pandemic is honestly a worldwide experiment. Um, it probably would have taken years to, you know, have pilots and studies and feedback on like productivity and stuff like that. It forced everyone in the world to try it. And I think it's um, it's really proven which jobs can be done remote and um, and which ones have to be done in person. Um, and so the overall trends are it's faster. Um, people are more productive too. It's, it's cheaper. Um, you know, we talked about the cost to, to flying someone out for interviewing, but um, if you talk about remote work as a whole, um, think of all the, the cost savings of, you know, office space, furniture, um, everything that, that goes into to that office. Um, and then uh, as far as candidate acceptance and quality, still TBD. Um, it's also kind of a weird time. So um, a lot of different factors um, once we get, you know, good data to, to consider there. Um, those are kind of the, the general themes right now. So what I'm focused on keeping improving, um, you know, is candidate experience, um, thinking of new ways. Like I said, it's, you know, a lot of people thought the market would be softening because um, unemployment is higher. But in tech, I still think that there's a lot of tech companies hiring and it's still pretty competitive. And, um, uh, you know, with an anxious candidates, um, you have to sell them to get them to move right now. Um, so thinking of new creative ways to, to create a good candidate experience is on my mind um, and giving candidates that sense of our culture without them witnessing it firsthand. Um, and then you know, we're doing a really good job about not having logistics misses, but um, but how to, you know, minimize them as much as humanly possible. Um, it's really up to every recruiter, every scheduler um, to be on point there. Post-COVID reality, whenever that is, right? It's looking a little bleak at the moment. Um, so will remote interviewing continue post COVID? I think yes. Um, I think that the benefits of cost, speed, and the ability to scale outweighs the challenges. Um, I do think that from a candidate experience perspective, um, I think like a happy medium would be instead of flying every candidate here, um, maybe the candidates we decide to move forward with offer we offer them like a cell trip so they get to, um, you know, see the area, um, you know, meet the team, things like that. Um, I think that that's important um, in the decision for people wanting to relocate. Like, you know, would you want to relocate somewhere if you had never been there before? Maybe not. Um, will more people work remote? Absolutely, yes. I think, again, it's proven which, um, which roles can be done remote. Um, I do think, and, and productivity, as you can see from the stats in the beginning, is up. Um, I do think it's going to be up to the candidate. Um, you know, some people on my team are thriving. You know, like I've had um, more of an introverted person on my team talking to me about how 
they love it, you know? Um, and um, also for people who were remote before COVID, um, I think that it um, it's kind of leveled the playing field, um, you know, whereas before, like there were some Redmond centric teams and then you'd have like being remote was like a, a little bit of like a one off or um, it's everyone's remote. So for like morale events and like team meetings, um, you're not shifting from like in the room to like, you know, asking people on the on the phone. Um, everyone has the same exact experience. Um, and I also think from uh, it's it's going to help widen the talent pool for some companies. You know, if you expected everyone at Microsoft to move to Redmond, it's going to limit your talent pool um, because some people are just not open to relocating. Like I'm not open to relocating. I have a four year old daughter and there's no amount of money you could pay me to make it worth it for her not to know her grandparents. Um, and so uh, you could be excluding really great people from your talent pool. And also, you know, diversity is a top of mind for everyone right now. Um, you know, there's some areas where there just is more diverse talent. And if you don't have an office there, um, you're expecting them to move here. Um, and so why not go to where the talent is versus forcing them to come here? Um, I also think that'll be better for retention. You know, some people relocate to an area and then they don't end up liking it or want to be close to their families. Um, so giving people that flexibility, I think, will help with retention as well. All right. So let's talk. I think that uh, there's some maybe questions. Yeah. So um, just a, a fun reminder for everyone. So you can, of course, leave a question in the uh, in the question box. But we do have a couple of questions we can go ahead and get started with. Uh, First of all, the presentation was awesome. I even, I'm always learning things whenever I host webinars with our team. Um, and so one of the first questions that jumped out at me that, uh, that I saw in there that I was actually curious about as well is, um, you know, how you prepare your team for those really massive shifts. So the question here is, uh, you know, how do you essentially introduce new tools or new processes to those teams and, and do it at scale? You mentioned doing that. So I thought I'd be interested to start off there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, things during COVID moved really fast. And so um, I think the clarity was key. So just giving recruiters, hiring managers as much clarity as possible. Um, you know, with new tools, like we do video trainings, um, live trainings, we'll have like flows and, and um, like docs that people can do on their own time. Um, I know a lot of times recruiters will do like live training with hiring managers that haven't used a tool like Codility before just to, um, cause recruiting is not their day job. Um, so some of them may recruit a lot. Some of them, it may be like once every six months. So, um, sometimes it's a little bit faster just to kind of like walk them through it live. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think being clear on communication, um, and communicating in different ways too um, is one thing that I've realized when things are moving so fast and like people also have a lot going on at home, um, you know, a lot of times I'd communicate via email, via like our IM Teams threads and then in team meetings and one-on-ones and just like, you know, making sure that people are clear in multiple different ways of communicating. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, that's something we can all learn from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, it, it sounds like there's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, so this question did did jump out at me as well, which is, uh, what is kind of one of the I guess, I guess the improvements that you've made to your process because it's been remote that that you and your team are the most proud of. It's a good question. Um, it um, so it's a little easier to talk about data centers versus Microsoft as a whole because it's so gigantic. Um, so in data centers, um, we actually use this as an opportunity to, to take a deep look at our interview process. So I worked really closely with a lean process PM in data centers. Um, shout out to Kristen, changed how I think. <laughs> um, but we, we spent some time mapping out our current state of interview process like super detailed. I made it sound really simple as like a three-step thing, but when you think about each pass-off and um, 
we took a look at like where there was duplication of work, um, where there was waste. Um, so, you know, like if a hiring manager was looking at a resume, um, usually it takes them a couple days to get back to you. Um, and so we looked at like which roles maybe we're doing in volume and the recruiter has enough knowledge where maybe the manager doesn't even need to look at the resume. Maybe, you know, uh, the recruiter can own that. So we just, um, we mapped out current state, like identified any kind of bottlenecks and, um, and we cleaned it up. Um, and uh, some of it we've already done, made some changes, um, little tweaks here and there. And then um, for the uh, data centers, we're about to um, roll out kind of um, a very lean um, interview process. Um, so the interesting thing with data centers is um, they're essential employees. And so we've had to, you know, where a lot of companies are slowing down in hiring, we have, we've had to hire faster and more because um, they're doing like rotations and being very careful about like quarantines and stuff like that. So um, uh, we've actually had to hire more and hit like new records in, in hiring. Um, so it's been like, you know, when the rest of the market is doing one thing, we've been doing the opposite, um, which is kind of fun. So, so yeah, we worked really closely with a lean process PM and, and went through our interview process. Well, that makes sense. Um, and I guess what, you know, a question here, but what tools kind of within that process, um, what tools and techniques do you use to, I guess, kind of make that leaner or simplify it? Yeah, um, good question. Um, so as far as process, um, you know, I mean, like Codilly would be a good example for software engineers where, um, you know, does a hiring manager need to spend an hour you know, with that candidate on the phone, or could you do the take home test, which, um, you know, the candidate can do on their own time. And, um, and then the hiring manager, I, I don't know how long it takes them to grade. I think it's like five or 10 minutes on average, right? So, you know, if you think about like, that's shaving 50 minutes of, you know, a highly paid engineer leaders time, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then think about like, how much interview how many interviews you're doing how many hires you make and it's a lot of time savings where they can be shifting that time to more impactful work and their business goals because again recruiting isn't their their job you know they have like products to release and services and things like that so um you know saving saving time both uh you know anytime we shaved recruiter time hiring manager time um off of our process, it that equates to money too. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think the the next question I saw here that that kind of I think is on the same topic um, around uh, candidates and saving time and things like that is, you know, how do you you talked a little bit about preparing I think for the internal team and and building that process, but how do you really present that to the candidate now that it's remote? Yeah, like, uh, are you saying like, how do you present kind of like what the interview process is going to look like and prep them for the interview day? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the question was uh, specifically, yeah, how do you um, prepare the the candidate to understand the remote process? Yeah. Um, so usually um, in that initial HR screen, you're kind of like walking the candidate through. Um, hey, you know, next. Next step is either going to be like an OTS online text screen or a phone call with a manager. Then it's a, a loop interview that's four or five interviews, all virtual. So you're talking about it in the beginning, but then you repeat it again before their loop interview. We have recruiters do a prep. Um, you know, they'll get the schedule ahead of time from the scheduler. But um, in that prep, you're going over, you know, first of all, you know, how they're feeling about things, answering any questions, um, then going over interview prep as far as like what they should study for, you know, the tech questions and then the competency questions. Um, and then you're going through um, just scheduler, schedule line by line. This is your first, this is the date, time. Um, this is what to expect. This is how you'll interact with this person. Like this would be your direct manager or this would be your skip manager or hey, this person's from a sister team, but you'd partner with them. So giving them a little context um, of who they're meeting. Um, uh, so then they can like, you know, look them up on LinkedIn and 
um, and kind of, you know, wrap their head around things. Um, but we just, we walk through that. And then also when they'll hear back from us, you know, um, you know, you should hear back between X time um, on the decision. Um, and then uh, the last thing is, is I just pull up the link and I have them test it and do a video with me real quick. Um, so then they know it works and there's no confusion there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not rocket science and this is like simple stuff, but it can make or break the candidate's experience. Like if, if their video doesn't work or their sound doesn't work when they're starting their first interview, like that's going to make them panicked and it's hard to get candidates to, to relax and do their best work in that environment. Um, so, um, or if they don't show up to an interview or they're late, um, you know, that, that makes people not, not do their best interview performance. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. It's what I mentioned to customers all the time is always testing something before you do it live <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, the the next question I know the answer to, but um, the next question actually that I saw in here was um, what's Codility a new tool for Microsoft kind of during this transition and and how did you prepare um, the internal team to to kind of or how long did it take the internal team to adapt to it? Good question. So, no, we were using Codility previously and again because of the time savings um but i i don't have any stats on this maybe you do but i think we probably are using a heck of a lot more now <laughs> more teams are probably <laughs> using it um but as far as how long it takes to learn the actual tool um not very long it's pretty easy for recruiters and hiring managers i think that the thing that takes longer is the business readiness and what i mean by that is um there's engineering leaders who have been interviewing a certain way for years, like 20 years. And um, and so to get them to shift their mindset and trust a tool um, is, is sometimes tricky. Um, and because uh, like some of them think they're like friggin' recruiting geniuses and can tell top talent. Um, so I think that um, getting them to shift their mindset and usually what helps with that is showing them hard data of like, hey, this group did it and they noticed, you know, no difference in candidate quality um, and here are the benefits, here are the drawbacks and also showing them the time savings. Um, you know, we're a big company, but even at like small companies, like a startup, like your time is even more precious because usually you're wearing multiple hats. So um, uh, the time savings was kind of like what got them to mentally shift. And then usually once they try it, they see the efficiency and they're on board. Um, but it's just like that that lack of control or that control they're losing that I think is the harder thing for them to adjust to than the actual tool. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, I think in uh, in that vein, kind of the the next question I saw here was, um, you know, what 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 do you think some of the I guess the question here was, you know, what do you think some of the biggest challenges are uh, to adapting to that type of remote interview? Um, there is kind of an element of the control piece, I think that plays in there, but I'd be curious to kind of see your answer. Yeah, um, that's 100% the number one thing is losing the control and the visibility. Um, uh, that's that's the number one thing. And just doing something different, like, you know, you really have to take the time with, when you're introducing it to like um, your engineering teams, you have to take the time to explain the why. Um, and um, and, it, and just knowing where they're going to push back helps. Um, so one is loss of control. Um, I've also heard like sometimes they'll have fear of like people cheating for the the take home version. You know that's timed. They're like, well, what if they copy and paste online? And so just knowing what the common objections are going to be and how to answer them um, helps. Um, I'm trying to think of any other objections. I. Uh, probably the control, the fear of cheating, and then um, what would it be? Those are probably the main ones. And then just just thinking that the um, the uh, quality of candidates won't be the same is usually the big one. So as long as you have like something prepped to mm -hmm. say to all those things of like, oh, they actually account for it in this way, then it helps versus being on the spot if you weren't anticipating those questions, I think. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then kind of taking a shift to two candidates there, in the, the interview process, can you describe kind of what the ideal candidate profile is 
especially for tech, but I think it could be more broad as well. Um, and kind of, that's yeah, here. absolutely. <laughs> so um, at Microsoft, we're looking for a blend of technical skills and competencies. So um, when it comes to tech skills, you know, um, strong fundamentals, coding, design um, skills, um, but we also focus very heavily on competencies because um, tech changes and it moves really fast. And so hiring people with those core competencies like adaptability uh, is more important in our opinion, even than, than tech skills sometimes because you know, um, a language you learned 25 years ago may or may not be relevant right now. So, um, so like, an adaptability is a great example. I mean, like, COVID, uh, it's, that's probably, like, the number one competency you need during COVID is just adaptability because, like, it's been a wild ride of changes and, and, and things like that. But um, uh, other competencies would be, like, customer focus or, um, like, what are some other ones? Uh, like drive for results. I mean, every company looks for different types of competencies, but um, having some some good examples um, uh, prepped of, of examples when you've done that in past work experiences is important. And then for data centers, like our that's that's all geared more towards like software engineers. Um, for data centers, we recruit so many different profiles, like real estate, construction, renewable energy, like data center technicians. And so um, technical skills is different for all of those, um, but competencies are the same. Awesome, that makes sense. Um, and then I guess a, a positive kind of, I guess, fun one to, to ask here is, were there any special experiences that you had, I guess, during remote interviews so far or any special moments that are kind of fun to share um, since we are all quickly adapting to this? Yeah, um, remote interviews, uh, fun stories to share. Uh, this wasn't an interview, but um, this is a funny video remote scenario. I, um, I was doing um, a, a meeting with one of the leaders on my team. Um, he's like a couple levels uh, higher than me. And then he noticed something in my background. That's actually why I moved my camera in this angle in the beginning here, I'll show you. And I had this thing and he's like, I keep seeing this in your background, what is that? And I'm like, oh, it's actually my cat's urn. And he's like, that's weird. Like you have your cats, like an Egyptian cat urn in your background. Um, so that was kind of funny, but I feel like in general, it's just a bizarre time. Like people's kids and dogs and husbands and come online. And I think it, it in a way it's cool seeing your leaders be a little more human. Um, so I don't know, there is a cool aspect of it where you get a little more insight into, you know, everyone's chaotic life right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Actually, an, an interesting question I saw here from someone who has worked at Microsoft before, um, and they kind of had that question around time to hire. Uh, they said it used to be, you know, let's say, you know, 60 to 90 days. But in your opinion, you know, how how do you think that'll reduce, uh, you know, because of a virtual process? Yeah, um, great question. And um, as far as the time to hire, it depends on the role and the org. Um, so some roles are just easier to fill than others. Some of them are really niche. And if you're looking for a purple squirrel, it's probably gonna be longer than something that's really common, common and easy to hire. Um, so it, it just varies a lot um, depending on the org. Um, but I do think remote hiring is absolutely making us faster. So um, for instance, if you think about like scheduling a phone screen with a manager, let's say you do the take home test instead so um, the recruiter, right when they get off the, the, the phone screen with the candidate, they can send them that document. They can do it on their own time. Um, you don't have to wait until the candidate and the hiring manager schedules a line. So that just saves time. Um, and they could do it on a weekend if they want or an evening or, you know, whenever. So that stage saves time. A second piece is um, when scheduling loops. Um, if a candidate had to travel here, they would have to, like, figure out all those logistics, that would take longer. Um, and lining up a day where we could have them meet everyone that they needed to in one day sometimes takes longer because sometimes you have like people who you can find an alternate, but some people are really crucial um, to that team. Um, and so if 
the schedules don't align, sometimes you have to push it out a week. Um, uh, whereas um, with remote, you can do it over multiple days. Um, so it, you can get it done a lot faster. It's just easier like to match schedules um, and you cut out the travel time. It, sometimes candidates don't even have to take times off, off. Like if you were doing like two interviews in one day, you know, two in another, and they were towards the tail end of your day or at the beginning of your day, you wouldn't have to miss work at all. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's shaving off a lot of time. No, yeah, absolutely. I don't have any specific stats, uh, and it varies so much by group, but it is saving yeah. time. It, it does vary, yeah. Um, no, that, that's that's super true. And I think uh, the kind of another question I saw here, kind of on that, I think moving between different meetings, I think we all book our calendars a lot. So this one jumped out at me. Um, but how do you kind of keep the morale high, you know, in the kind of working conditions of, of a global pandemic, and and how does that kind of relate to you know, the interview process, right? Because you have to keep things really kind of uplifting, especially if we're trying to bring people into our organizations. Yeah, yeah. And keeping the energy high during uh, these crazy times is tough sometimes. But um, so things we've done on my team is um, in my team meetings, uh, uh, the GM of my group, he likes to do a one word check-in. So I've kind of done a spin on that and I do a one GIF check-in. So everyone kind of like, it's like a funny way, like if you're feeling shitty, you can say it through a GIF. It's like a little bit more, I don't know, uh, it's just like using humor. It kind of makes people a little more authentic. So then I know like if my team's at like a two, I'm not going to come in at a 10 energy wise. I'm going to like, you know, not be tone deaf. So that's one thing I do. We do a lot of like virtual morale events. Like remember when like you couldn't get hand sanitizer anywhere? Um, uh, this gal, Catherine on my team, she did like a virtual how to make your own hand sanitizer. And we all did that together. Um, we did Val on my team did like a crock pot virtual cooking class, which, you know, like all these things, like it, we're doing something, but we're just like, you know, hanging out. Cause, um, you know, we've done like, we watched Groundhog's Day, which is basically what we're all living right now. <laughs> so it wasn't quite as funny as I remembered it before. Uh, so like, we just, you have to be a little bit more intentional about spending time together. Cause what I noticed is like, at first everyone was just like trying to like survive, you know, with kids and the changes and like everything, everyone was kind of in survival mode. Um, but then as we went on, we realized that there wasn't those like organic, like, Hey, I'm grabbing coffee in the kitchen and I ran into this person or, you know, hallway talk. And so you have to be intentional about it and plan it. We've done, um, like uh we did kind of like a uh coffee chain thing uh we called it spill the tea you know kind of like the memes and gossiping and so like somebody would start it and then they would put an invite like a 15 minute invite in somebody's calendar and then you challenge them to do someone else and it had to be someone you didn't know um so that was kind of fun um but you just you have to like create those moments because they don't come organically and, other, and and then you'd go like, I remember early on, I'd be like, man, I've got a week and I haven't like talked to anyone for anything other than work because each meeting has like a purpose. Um, and so you just have to be intentional about it. Yeah, mind. absolutely. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of virtual trivia over at Codility. So, so oh, we definitely yeah. think like good ideas. Yeah. Um, cool, and then I think uh, we probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, so one of the things that I kind of, I guess, going back to, to the topic of hiring, although I think it's always fun to take a, a good break, um, what are some of the metrics that you're tracking in your process and are there any new ones that you're tracking uh, due to, to COVID and remote hiring? Yeah, um, we track, track all kinds of metrics like, um, uh, like, you know, we pay close attention to like diversity metrics, we pay attention to like just volume of each stage of, you know, application and um, when they hit each stage. One thing that we're paying close attention to right now, it, or me at least, in data centers is decline rates, because I'm curious if they're going to go up, down, or stay about the same. Um, and so um, that's one thing I'm, I'm really paying attention to and not even just like the numbers, but I'm looking at the reason codes. Um, so, you know, is it candidates opting to stay where they are or did we lose to another competitive offer? Um, 
uh, I'm just I'm just curious. That's just like out of my own personal curiosity. I'm curious if they're going up or down, because if they do go up, then we have to account for that. Right. Then we'll need a little bit more pipeline on the front end to make sure that we're getting the hires that we need to. Or we need to like change up how we're doing things and improve the candidate experience or, you know, our selling of that candidate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think the, the last question uh, here, because I think we're about three minutes out and yeah. you know, maybe we'll fit more in, who knows. Um, the is just kind of uh, looking forward, you know, how are you talking with candidates today about, you know, of course, remote work, maybe hire them in a different location. Um, and the question was, you know, will they eventually kind of bring relocation back onto the table or, or how do you handle that in the beginning part of the process? Because it's kind of unknown. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's such a great question. And it's tricky. And every every company is handling it a little bit differently. Um, so first thing we're looking at is like, if somebody isn't local, we're asking that hiring manager, like, can this role be done remote, you know, permanently, um, if that's the candidate's preference. Um, and so we're kind of like looking into that a lot more and asking that question a lot more. Um, and then there are some people that do want to remote to to relocate to Redmond, but it's like not exactly safe right now, you know. Um, and so how we're handling that is if it's within the U.S., um, you know, we're just starting them remote for right now. Um, and then, um, you know, when they're able to use the relocation benefits and they feel safe to to relocate, then then they can do that. Um, but um, we're we're kind of leaving it up to candidates right now um, and encouraging them to like be safe and start remote. Um, but uh, kind of spending some extra time talking to hiring managers about their the long term, you know, because I mean, this could last another year maybe more. We don't know. Um, so it's just it's it's more of a dialogue with each offer, I'd say. And we're kind of coming up with like a rough game plan. That's awesome. Um... Well, great. So I guess I just want to spend some time to, you know, thank you for everyone for attending the webinar today. I really enjoyed learning from you, Damina. Um, just wanted to make a quick announcement that our next webinar will be on July 23rd for reshaping the future of campus hiring. So another exciting topic. Um, and then for everyone that's still, uh, you know, on the call today, you'll receive a recording of the webinar in a couple of days. But again, thank you so much, Damina. And it's uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everyone.